But Jung, see, he, he had a different idea, and his idea was that it wasn't the failed hero story that was the universal human myth. It was the successful hero story. And that's a big difference. Like, it's seriously a big difference. Because the successful hero story is, remember in Sleeping Beauty, you may remember this in, in the Disney movie, the evil queen traps the prince in a dungeon, and she's not going to let him out till he's old, right? And so there's this comical scene where she's down in the dungeon, he's all in chains, and she's laughing at him, telling him what his future is going to be like. She's quite evil. And, you know, she, she paints this wonderful picture of him being freed in like 80 years and hobbling out of the castle on his, his horse that's so old he can barely stand up, and him with gray hair. And, and you know, and she recites this story of his eventual triumphant departure from the castle as an old and decrepit man, and she has a great laugh about it. And it's nice, you know, it's a real punchy story. It's really something wonderful for children, that story. <laughs> and uh, um, he gets free of the, of the shackles. And the things that free him are three little female fairies. So it's the positive aspect of the feminine that frees him from the dungeon. It's so it's very interesting and very accurate from a psychological perspective. It's the negative element of the feminine that encapsulates him in the dungeon. And it's the positive element of the feminine that frees him. And, and then he, he has a, the queen, the evil queen, is not very happy when he escapes. You may remember this. She stands on top of her castle tower and starts to spin off cosmic sparks. I mean, she's quite the creature, enveloped in flame, and then she turns into a dragon. And she, then the prince has to fight with her in order to make contact with Sleeping Beauty and, and awaken her from her comatose existence as her unconscious existence. And uh, well, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant representation of a successful hero myth. He he doesn't end up staying in an unholy relationship with his mother. Let's say he escapes and then conquers the worst thing that can be imagined, and is ennobled by that. And that, as a consequence, he's able to wake the slumbering feminine from its coma. And that's a Jungian story. And that's the story that he juxtaposed against Freud. See, Freud thought of religious phenomena as part of an occult tide that would, be, that would drown rational, rationality. That's why Freud was so vehemently anti-religious. And Jung thought, no, it's not the case. You're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There's something profound and central to the hero myth and Jungian clinical work is essentially the awakening of the hero myth in the in the in Elizand, in the in the client or in the patient, to conceptualize yourself as that which can confront chaos and triumph, and that that's associated with an ennobling of the of consciousness and the establishment of po proper positive relationships between male and female. And you know, I'm a skeptical person. I'm a very, very skeptical person, and I've tried with every trick I have to put a lever underneath Jung's story and lift it up and, and disrupt it, and I, I can't do it. I think he was right and that Freud was wrong. I mean, I have great respect for Freud. I think he got the problem, problem diagnosed very, very nicely, and in my clinical work, I see the phenomena that Freud described emerge continually, constantly. The, the best... If you're interested in that, there's a documentary you should watch. I may have mentioned it before. I think it's the best documentary ever made. It's certainly the best one I've ever seen. It's called Crumb. And it's about an underground cartoonist, Robert Crumb, who, who was part of the hippie movement, in, although he hated hippies. He was part of the hippie movement in, in the 60s in San Francisco and started the entire underground comic what, culture that, that manifested itself eventually in, in graphic novels. He was quite a significant figure from the perspective of popular art and a very, very intelligent man and also, I would say, a hero, although a very bent and depraved and warped one uh, someone very acutely aware of his own shadow and the documentary outlines his attempts to escape from his absolutely dreadful mother and the failure of his two brothers to do the same thing 
one of whom ended up as a street beggar in San Francisco and the other who drank furniture polish and died six months after the documentary was produced. It's an unbelievably shocking documentary. It's the only piece of film that I've ever seen that captures Freudian pathology. I've never seen anything, because you can't see it generally unless you're in a clinical situation, unless you know the details of someone's lives, the personal, intimate details. You cannot communicate it. But the documentarist who made the film, who's Robert Zwigoff, if I remember correctly, was a friend of the Crumbs. And so he got access in a way that no one else would have. And they were also very forthright and forthcoming about their situation in general. I would highly recommend that. It's, it's a real punch. If you want to know how a rapist thinks, like if you actually want to know, because maybe you don't want to know. In fact, you probably don't want to know. <laughs> right, because do you really want to know that? Because to understand that means to put yourself in that position and to understand it. If you really want to know how a serial sexual predator thinks and why, if you watch Crumb and you pay attention, you'll know. And that's only a tiny bit of what the film has to offer. It's really quite remarkable. Anyways, 